Go on, get to the raft. The water's cold. You have to get there in a hurry. Just let it get away from you. Get that girl. Call her. Come on, get up to her. This is not an actual drowning, of course, but it is part of the water survival course you should know about. I'm Homer Circle, and I took this survival course along with a dozen other interested students under the watchful eye of instructor Wayne Williams. That's right, do it. Having completed the course, I'm rescuing a simulated drowning victim, and the idea is to get them out of the water and into the raft as quickly as possible. Well, as you can observe, this isn't easy. May I help now we're going to fall in. And now, watch closely, because what you are about to see could help you save a life, perhaps your own, as veteran instructor Wayne Williams takes us through this water survival course at Nova University near Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The training area is over here, and uh, as you can see, we have a marine life raft, a person and a 25-man raft. Nice looking And equipment. the uh, large metal structure here is a helicopter pickup simulator. We use the equipment here to sort of precondition people. There's a lot of terror in not knowing what you're facing, you know, <laughs> what, what an emergency involves. Yes, sir. If you, can re if you can get in the water and use the equipment and uh, learn a simple, few simple procedures, they can make a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Because in, in reviewing a lot of accidents at sea and in the water generally, you have to see that the little things kill a lot of people. Not necessarily big catastrophes or disasters, but it's just a collection of little tiny things that a little bit of knowledge would counteract. Wayne, what can a person in a smaller boat do to attract attention? Yell help. Real loud, huh? Real loud. <laughs> what else? Well, signaling can be a lot of things. Uh, the goal of signaling is to take your very insignificant size down there as seen in the water in a life vest, perhaps, from any distance at all, you're, you're hardly visible. And to make that larger, okay, you want to be larger so you can be seen. There's a number of ways you can do that. Uh, a dye marker will stain the water with a distinctive color, make you stand out. Something as simple as uh, stirring up calm water will make a stirred up area that would catch someone's eye that's looking for you. Uh, there are many types of smoke flares and uh, power technique, uh, parachute flares, things like that. Uh, signal mirrors work beautifully. Uh, that's one device that won't burn Wayne out. demonstrates the use of mirrors or other reflecting surfaces to catch the attention of a passing boat or plane and bring help. This is a military specification type mirror. It has a built-in sight, but the way I'm going to show you how to use it would apply to any reflective surface. You could open up a beer can or a water can or use a lady's pocket mirror or anything else. Start out by getting a reflection on your hand like this. And then make a sight out of your two fingers as though it were a gun sight. Now, if you had an aircraft up there you're trying to attract, you would aim that sight right at the aircraft. And as you see with the reflection on there, the reflection's getting to the aircraft, right? And you can do that all the way around the horizon simply by keeping the reflection on your hand, like this. And as long as you have the reflection there and the object you're trying to attract in the sight, you're going to get somebody's attention. Any questions on that? You'll find these in glass, you'll find them in metal, and as I said, you can improvise them. And it's very important. It's a good signal. It carries about 30 miles out there. Try this as we did here, and you'll quickly see how effective a signal mirror can be. The shiny bottom of a soft drink can works also. And a die marker is a practical attractor for passing aircraft. This one's been used several times, and I, I want to make a point with it. If you were out there in your raft, you probably only have one die marker. You don't want to waste it. So when the airplane comes, you put the thing in the water, make a big stain with it, as I'll show you. That airplane misses you doesn't see it, take it back out of the water, wrap it up, and save it for the next time. Don't just let it sit out there and go to waste, because it will in about two hours it's gone. I'm going to put it in the water now and show you how it looks.
and we'll see how much is left in this one. It's just about gone, but I've used the thing about a dozen times. And even with this little bit of powder, we could still get a respectable stain, cover about half this basin pretty quickly. You see, it's still coming out. Of I asked Wayne about the possibility of adding shark repellent to the dye marker. No, no repellent at all. And of course, it wouldn't work very well in your very light colored waters either. Out there or in the, say, the Bahamas waters or any light colored area, a shark chaser would be a good signal because it creates a dark stain. Okay, we'll go on to the next phase now. And now we get into the survival situation of suddenly finding yourself in deep water without a flotation device. Wayne shows how to utilize your clothing to keep afloat. You'll notice I have this shirt buttoned all the way up to the neck. I probably wouldn't go into the water in the emergency with it that way. But I'm going to try to show you how to use it as a life jacket. And in order to do that, you have to button it up to the neck. I'm going to unbutton the second button down, take a deep breath, stick my head under, and blow into the hole I've created by opening that button. And what I'll try to do is get a large hump of air behind my shoulders. Now, this is behind me, I can't tell how big it is, but I can tell that something's holding me up pretty well. Can you see the hump? For short sleeves, you have to keep your arms in close to the body. Long sleeves, you wouldn't have to worry about it. If you let your arms out the timbo like that, the air would run out easily. All right, unbutton my pants, take them off. I'm gonna try to get these off over my shoes. With these shoes, I just soon keep them on. First thing I'm gonna do is zip them back up. It's a lot more awkward to button flies. Tying the two legs together, as far down as toward the ends as possible, a little overhand knot. Spread the pants out on the water, grab the waistband, hold it open, and do this. So remember these two flotation devices you usually have on at all times, your shirt and your pants. There's only one way to learn how to do it, and that's to do it. So watch closely and practice this the next time you're around water. In fact, it's something you should practice with the entire family. For whatever you usually wear in a boat, wear it and see how you do. Who, me? Let's go. <laughs> well, must or must, I guess. <laughs> Even a non-swimmer can practice this in shallow water or a swimming pool and learn the technique which could save his or her life. Kind of get into a semi-back float, slide them off your hips, down over your feet, your shoes. Well, I found out that a one-piece jumpsuit is not the garment to wear. As you can see, it's hard to get off and even harder to inflate, while my companions are having no trouble getting out of their pants and inflating them. And bring them over sharply and down. <laughs> That's why we practice. But heck, I've worn these jumpsuits fishing for over 30 years, so it's a tough habit to break. Well, it isn't easy, but I finally get one leg inflated, and that beats nothing. We'll return in a moment to Nova University and Wayne Williams' survival course for a close look at life preservers. And I urge you to watch closely. This should shock you different types in the classroom. I want to show you a few to refresh your memory. This is a type one by Coast Guard rating. It has K-POC in it. It's an older type, and the K-POC is packed in here in plastic bags. The problem is that as the life vest ages, plastic deteriorates, the K-POC, which is a natural fiber, will get moisture in it, and you lose a lot of buoyancy. Until that happens, it has a reasonable amount of buoyancy. This type one foam device is a lot more modern, very comfortable compared to that. Uh, smaller and will not deteriorate and be affected, but being a type one, it has the characteristics of self-riding you if you're unconscious and holding your unconscious face out of the water in a lot of different sea conditions. Type three is used by a lot of recreation people 
because it's smaller and thinner and a lot more comfortable. You have to realize that the Type 3, if you're in, any, in the water any length of time at all, hours, once you become unconscious, it will not hold your unconscious face out of the water. We've had people drown in these once they become unconscious. Uh, until that point, it's a deep vest. On the airlines, you can encounter two different kind of vests. And that's important for you to know because suppose you saw a briefing on one airline and you watched the briefing because you'd never seen one before. You get on another airline, they may be demonstrating a different vest to you. You don't realize it, so you don't watch. You've seen the vest demonstration. But what we'll do is show you the difference between the two. And I'll start with this one. It's one of the two types. You'll notice that it's intended to be fully reversible. There's been a lot of confusion in accidents. People kept looking for the front side. There is no front side. They're both front sides. With this vest, you have to do this. You have to hold it in front of you, find these straps on the sides, like this, and of course, you, if you'd read the information card, you'd know all that. You put your neck through the opening. You have to extend your arms through these straps. And after you do that, you pull down sharply on the back to extend that back panel. Having done that, you pull these waist straps snug around your waist. You don't have to tighten them a great deal. And just before you leave the airplane to go into the water, you tug sharply on these handles. And the vest inflates. If later on you have to add air to it, you do it through these little valves right here. Uh, we'll show you the other one. This is the alternate type of airline vest. You'll notice the straps are not connected on this one. That's where the confusion would come in between the two types. Put it over your head. Again, it's not reversible. You bring the straps behind you. You have to find the ends. Connect them to this little ring in front. adjust it snugly around the waist, and then just before you went into the water, you would inflate the vest. What we're going to do is simulate an airline accident in the water at night, which is a worst case condition. You've had no time to get the vest on because you didn't know it was going, anything was going to happen. So you've got to grab your vest, go out of the airplane, put it on in the water, in the waves at night. So I want to give each one of you a vest and one of these little blindfolds, just pass them around. Put the blindfold on your forehead with a knot to the rear. Now, using blindfolds, we're going to simulate being tossed into the water at night. This stresses the importance of having flotation devices handy at all times and the need to be familiar with their operation, especially how to get them on properly. These flotation devices are in zipped plastic bags, which must be opened by your sense of feel, the life preserver unfolded, and put on. Okay, so Uncle Homer gives this night survival a try. Now, right now, my mind is mulling over the fact <coughs> that I'm about as buoyant as a bowling ball. And here I am jumping into deep water, blindfolded, and expected to tread water while I fumble my way into a zipped plastic bag, then extract and properly put on a flotation vest of unfamiliar design. Well, it is a challenge. I finally get into it, but incorrectly because the straps are badly tangled. Do you realize which of the two types you have? So by actually experiencing how to keep oneself afloat, we all gain confidence in our newly acquired ability to survive in deep water emergencies. But as Wayne explains, there's still another threat. Well, there's something called hypothermia. The word means loss of body heat or abnormal loss of body heat. I'll give you a good example of hypothermia that's rather shocking. In 1963, a Greek tour ship caught fire off the Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, due to lack of room in the lifeboats and rafts, 200 people had to go into the water wearing high buoyancy marine life vests. Rescue arrived within three hours and found of the 200, 118 dead. Uh, that's three hours. The water temperature was 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's, that's a rather shockingly warm water to think about hypothermia problems. But hypothermia can occur in any water, anywhere. To point out the main heat loss areas of the body. Well, it, the areas uh, would be the lower neck area, the center of the chest, the sides of the chest, and the groin area. These are areas where we don't have much insulation. We have thin walls, or we have major blood vessels close to the surface that act as heat transfer points. So controlling hypothermia is a matter of sealing off those loss areas as best you can. 
uh, you have to recognize from what I just showed you that any movement opens up those areas. So we teach a position called the heat escape lessening posture that was developed by the hypothermia researchers, which effectively is a fetal position. Wayne joins us to demonstrate how to conserve body heat and lessen hypothermia. Now we're gonna practice this hypothermia position and I'm gonna demonstrate a little bit for you and talk about it and then I'll work with you as you do it. The first, the individual position, is called the heat escape lessening posture, right? I'm gonna adopt it now. I clamp my arms in against the sides of the chest to seal off the sides of the chest. I'm holding the vest against my chest for insulation. I'm gonna let my knees come up and cross my ankles two, and I'm having stability problems. I'll keep the legs together and try that. What you don't want to do, of course, is rock so much that you can't keep your face out of the water. Now, I can maintain this position pretty well in this water. If it were rougher, I might have to sacrifice, open up the groin area by extending my legs like this for stability, so I wouldn't rock. In no event would I reach out this way to stabilize myself because I'm opening up the whole chest area of the cooling. Okay. So arms in close to the sides, hold your legs up close if you can, close off the groin, cross the ankles. But if you rock too much, work with the position and experiment. Okay, Elmer, I'd like you Wayne asked three water. of us to huddle together in the water and see how we can share not only body warmth, but also buoyancy. <laughs> Another value of huddling is to calm those who could be frightened in water especially children and older people who might not be in good physical trim. It also helps to conserve energy and keep up sagging spirits in what could be a long ordeal until rescue comes. If you have to... And now, here's one last technique Wayne wants to emphasize, jumping from a high position like off a sinking plane or ship. There's several objectives here. The first is to not land on anything sizable down there. It might be a person, you'd hurt them a lot. Uh, or a sizable piece of wreckage, you'd hurt you a lot. So the, one of the parts of the procedure is to simply look down and make sure there's nothing there. Then you come across your life vest with an arm and grab your sleeve and hold your vest down firmly with one arm. Come across that arm, hold it down, cup your lower face like that. But that protects the face. You look out at the horizon, don't look down anymore, and then you simply step off. Don't jump. If you jump, you're going to rotate and go on your back. If you look down, you're probably going to go face forward. Look straight out to the horizon, step off, and as you step off, try to cross your ankles to protect the groin. If you can't do that, hold your legs tightly together. A young man in. A young lady in. And old Uncle Homer takes the plunge, too. And now the reactions and thoughts of the students are revealing. Listen. I fly planes all the time as a passenger. And uh, Wayne showed me that, you know, their safety isn't really my safety. It's up to me to know what to do with their equipment. Well, I think the most important thing is whenever you go through something one time, a trial run, you're, you'll be more prepared for if you were in a real life situation and you're less liable to um, panic and maybe can help other people from becoming panicky or frightened by the situation that they're in. Here now, Jack Miller, a pilot who actually experienced a plane ditching at sea before he had taken Wayne's course. We uh, evacuated the airplane and took our life raft, which we personally carried and had just been repacked. Uh, that raft did not open open halfway which is the same as not opening the life vest that we carried with us which we thought we knew how to use we couldn't it's uh, fortunate that we weren't out in the heavy sea because we would drown that's exactly what would have happened to us and it's very scary when you realize this as you evacuate your airplane and recognize that you could not save yourself and I think that's what Wayne and Nova teach you that you're on your own, you can save yourself. And certainly maybe save someone next to you or save another life. In over 50 years of boating and flying, I've never felt more certain of surviving in a water emergency. Two final points to remember. 
One, when you take a trip, be sure to let someone know where you're going and when you'll return. Then rescuers can find you if something happens. And two, when going boating, take your own flotation device because used boat cushions especially may no longer float you. So remember what you've seen and practice it with friends and family. It could just save a life, maybe yours. dog as graceful and good-looking as this one be rugged enough for the hardest hunting? Believe me, it can. You're looking at a Brittany Spaniel, the smallest of all the pointing breeds, but a mighty big favorite of hunters across the country. I'm Gritz Gresham, and today I'm in Goldsboro, North Carolina, to hunt with John Edwards, a professional breeder and trainer of Brittany's. What you got here, John? <laughs> Over the years, John has bred more than 1,500 Brittany pups. And before going afield, we take a look at some recent arrivals. Oh, my goodness. Grizzly pup's about three weeks old. And they've never been out before, out of the pen. Now, they are some cute. Now, this is what I call selective breeding. I develop a pup from characteristics of different dogs. Mm -hmm. This is what Try I to get the best characteristic dogs. different dogs. This is right and develop that type of dog. Now, how old do you say these are? Three weeks. Three weeks. They're three weeks old. Now, how old are they when you wean them? I wean them at six weeks. People pick them up at seven weeks at the kennel. Mm -hmm. Now, the federal law requires them to be eight weeks old before you can ship them. Okay, you got these pups at this age. Uh, what what do you do with them next? Seven eight weeks is very important to socialize with their pups. And this is where I recommend, why I recommend people raise them in the house if they possibly can. And uh, then in addition to the socialization, they get a little older, then I start to let them get used to the area. They will explore, go around, they got to find out what smells like what. Mm -hmm. And to get about three or four weeks or so, uh, months old, then I start taking them in the woods. Just let them have a good time, take them down here in the canal and let them play in the water so they get used to the water. This is very important because a lot of our grown dogs won't go to water. And it gets hot, and when it gets hot, it's better for that dog to get in water and gets cooled off, and then he hunts better. Now, these are the dogs that you're going to train. Right, they when I'm training myself. Yeah. I do not put pressure on them, but I do raise them to respond to me. What do we got here, John? The rest of these pups are eight weeks old. Well, they're about ready to get rid of, aren't you? Right. Normally, I ship them around eight weeks old. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, this is the stage that they're more adaptable to a new home. They're just to a new home quicker. Well, what should a new owner do? How should he treat the new pup? Well, the first thing, of course, he's been shipped, and he's a little bit upset, is take him out of the crate and play with him, get him used to, get him to accept him, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, it's best to let the pup come to you rather than you go to the pup. Clap your hands, squat down, and so forth, and let the pup come to you. When they first get the dog, they shouldn't start trying to train them or anything like that, should they? No, except if they want to housebreak him, they should start training him there. If they want to break him to go outside, normally it's best to, uh, right after he's been fed, to take him out to a certain spot that you want to go. Also, they'll give an indication when they want to go to start running around in a circle. You mm -hmm. pick them up then and take them out to that spot. Now, of course, some people work and can't be home all day, and the answer there is to break them to paper. Now, these look like they're pretty uh, uh, active and energetic. I think it's a good sign because a hunting dog, you want them. You want a, a nice energy, uh, energetic dog mm -hmm. uh, to work because he's got to get out, and some of them work all day long. And I try to breed this type of dog because a lot of people want it. And one that's got yeah. the energy at this age, he's probably going to keep it. More than likely, unless he's uh, treated too rough. If he's handled properly, he will keep it. Well, these have just been fed, and it looks like they're about to go to sleep on us. They do get sleepy when they get a full stomach. In a moment, we'll go hunting with Brittany's. Stay with us. A lot of people think a Brittany stays right underfoot, though, and these dogs get out pretty well. 
Well, I think the advantage is that they'll hunt to you in the woods and they get out in the field. Mm -hmm. If you get out in the field, then you don't have to walk around uh, the whole field, 200 acre field to cover it. Yeah, well, he's moving right out, but, but he's you, staying inside all that's day. That's right, he worked right in. Mm -hmm. In training Brittany Spaniels, John Edwards often uses pin-raised quail. He releases the quail, then takes the Brittany's out to hunt them. This dog has found one quickly. Now I'm going up and flush the bird. Now he'll chase. He's not broke steady winging shot. But you see how solid he is? I've never forced. Look how he dug his foot in when he stopped there. I can't imagine that nine months. You see the bird under there? Here, Mike. Here, Mike. Come here, Mike. Bring him here, Mike. Come on, boy. Come here, Mike. Come up. Mike, come on. Now, John, that was as pretty point as I've ever seen. Boy, that had some style. Well, it's actually bred into them, and uh, in, in addition to uh, being bred into them for hunting, it's also pretty in field trials. And um, I put a lot of emphasis on this because, as you know, there's a big difference in a dog just standing a bird and a mm. dog being intense and pointing. Uh, you notice that when he whirled around and pointed, he even buried his foot in the sand. Yeah. And this shows staunchness and eagerness and desire to please. Why was that dog able to catch a bird? Well, this is a domesticated bird, and they can't fly as good as wild birds. And, uh, of course, I had rather he wouldn't have caught the bird. Mm -hmm. But in as much as uh, uh, he did catch it, then you notice I got a retrieve out of it. Now, some pups, real young pups, of course, they've gotten a habit of... Uh, eating everything to get in their mouth. I've had young pups that used to uh, shoot down a bird for them and they run out there and eat it. Yeah. And some people get rough on them, go there and beat them, and uh, this is the wrong thing to do. It's okay, let him go and eat that one because he's gonna save a lot of birds for you later on. Now, the way I do when they get hard mouth, I just take uh, a bird like this and put me a couple of finishing nails in it. Mm -hmm. Throw it out there and let them clamp down on that finishing nail. And they get soft mouth real quick. Yeah, I bet they do. John, one of the things that, you know, people puzzle people, what do you look for in a puppy? What's the most Im important ingredient in a pup that will make him a good hunting dog? Well, Gritz, if I had to use one word, I'd say desire. Desire to please, desire to find birds, desire to retrieve. And if they've got that, and they've got the physical ability, you can make a bird dog out of them. Of course, they've got to be bred to have confirmation so they can run all day. They've got to have a nose, of course to smell a bird. But if they don't have that desire to hunt, desire to find birds, and desire to please, you got a problem, you see. That's Buckaroo on point. That's Buckaroo on point. Samantha back here. Yeah. Rich, you see the dog here on point, and Samantha is backing. Now, they, uh, I teach them to honor to sight. Now, the advantage of teaching them to back to sight, of course, is sometimes you can find your dog backing easier than you can find the dog on point. Yeah, he could be in a thicket. Now, if that dog should come up here and back right at the dog, you the same way as just finding one dog, right. you see. Now, I'm going in and flush the bird, and uh, they are, uh, whoa, Buck, are you woke? That bird is buried in a stump hole over here. Yes. Yeah, and he still <laughs> smells that bird. He didn't move a peg. No. Now, the positive way here of sending a dog on is tap him on the head. By doing this, if somebody else hollers, you see, you still won't move your dog. Yeah, if you touch him physically. If you touch him physically and send him on. Yeah. And this is the advantage of that, of course. B. Hi. Hi. Hi, B. She says he's right there. Oh. Well, that's a picture, isn't it? Oh, B. Oh, two of 
of them. <laughs> a woo? Woo? Oh. That's a good girl. Well, she had those pinned down, didn't yeah. she? After watching several of John's young Britneys in training, I'm eager to see them perform under actual hunting conditions. And so we head out through the pine woods on a cool afternoon, searching for wild bobwhite quail. John, if a guy was interested in a Brittany, why should he buy one? The main thing I like about a Brittany grits is they work close in the woods, and they'll get out in the field. They have a lot of natural ability, uh, natural retrievers, and they, they just uh, have a strong desire to please. Better than pointers or setters? Well, of course, I'm a little prejudiced, I'm sure, but I think so. Of course, they make good family pets. Mm -hmm. Man, in cover like this, you better have your dog under control, hadn't you? That's right, Brits. If we don't, you spend all day looking for your dog. And uh, that's one reason I like the Brittany. They uh, so easy to control and thick like this. That's Buck on point now, Griff. Oh, man, boy, he's settled in, isn't he? Let me move over here. I'll, I'll cover the left side here. Oh, boy, he's got him, hasn't he? Oh, uh, sure. Looks good. Okay, I'm going in and flush him. Okay. You shoot left, and I'll take right. Looks like they're really holding tight. Uh, looks like it. I don't see any in where it's a single or a covey. Probably in that thicket right in front of you. Okay, I'm going in. You ready? I'm ready. Let her have it. Hey! That buck! <laughs> that dead! That dead buck! That's it's dead. easy to see why Britneys have That's become dead. so popular. Dead, they're buck. handsome, compact, That's and quick to train. Best of all, That's they're versatile. John works them not only on quail, but also on grouse, here, pheasants, boy. ducks, and doves. Bring him here, buck. <laughs> Bring him here, buck. Drop him. That's a good boy. Man, there must have been 25 birds in that cubby. There must have been. That was a big cubby. How many did you get? Well, I shot twice, didn't I? <laughs> Where do a single? Brittany Spaniel, a skilled hunting dog and exciting companion. And John Edwards, breeder and trainer, is striving to make it even better. <laughs>